Now today, we're still going to continue in Ezekiel, and I want today to uh, begin to deal with the, the prophecy, Ezekiel's prophecy, of the invasion of Israel by Russia. You say, well, I didn't know the Bible talked about the invasion of Israel, Israel by Russia. Well, I know that uh, you've probably never been to church unless you came out of fundamentalism that did teach it. But uh, the Bible has much to say about the events in the Near East today. And so <clears throat> Russia uh, is all up here. One map won't do it all. But, but Ezekiel 38 and 39 predict, have predicted for centuries, millenniums, that one day out of the north would come a great horde of people called the Rosh, modern name for Russians, and come against Israel. And most people don't even know that. And it's, and it's getting ready to happen right now. I mean, God, as I so often say, isn't in the business of writing all of these detailed prophecies and verses just to entertain us with spiritual lessons. The church today says, well, this whole three chapters, 37, 38, and 39, 37 deals with Israel's restoration, 38 and 39 deals with uh, Russia coming against her and God destroying Russia. The church today tells us this uh, depicts the church's triumph over the world. Boom, that's all there is to it. And just verse after verse of details of what's going to happen. And like Ezekiel 40, 48 was uh, a picture of the church. All those details, how to rebuild the temple and reinstate the sacrifice and all. Now, we're going to be looking at 38 and 39, if we get that far today. I'm going to say a lot of things by introduction. But 37, 38, and 39 is a unit. Because 30, chapter 37 of Ezekiel, we've already, we preached on that over at Muncie, the resurrection of the dry bones and the putting of the two sticks together is a prophecy, a vision and a prophecy, of the resurrection of national Israel. It isn't teaching about the resurrection. There are plenty of scriptures that do that. But the resurrection of national Israel. And then 38 and 39 speak of the destruction of her one of her greatest enemies out of the north in the latter days. Now that couldn't happen until she was a nation again. She hasn't been a nation for 2,500 years. And so the miracle of 1948 sets in motion chapters 38 and 39, and I'll show you today how that what you read about in Time magazine and read in your newspapers every day about Israel, you notice all the news keeps sending around Israel, uh, and yet the average reader doesn't read about Israel, they'll see what's happening over in Cambodia and Vietnam. You see, <clears throat> most of the world's eyes today uh, are focused upon the Far East. Vietnam, Cambodia, China. And the important place to watch is the Middle East. The Far East is way over here off our map. The Middle East is, is this, you see. Uh, here's where we need to get our attention on Egypt and Israel and the Arab nations. You see little Israel, this little thing shaped like a diamond, a triangle. That's all the bigger Israel is. These same Arabic powers uh, he's going to bring them, God's going to do it, bring them against Israel and destroy them on the mountains of Israel. And so while you've got all of your attention focused on the Far East, God has his attention and Russia has her attention on the Near East. That is uh, what we mean by Near East, from Africa over uh, to, to where the Far East would start, you know, like China and that sort of thing. That's what we call the Far East, China and Japan. Now, all the major developments uh, of uh, the Middle East were prophesied. But as I say, uh, as I have said many times, we live in a generation where prophecy uh, and the prophets uh, are not dealt with at all in our churches. And so we're just, we're like babies. We have to start all over where the church uh, should be alert and aware of end time events just simply because it's taught in, in the church. But it isn't. Now, this is where, as I say, we have to give our attention because here's where civilization began. It began right here. Here's where Adam and Eve were, right here in this area. 
Here's the Garden of Eden. Then you, you say, where do you get that? You get it right out of Genesis. Name some of the rivers. And uh, it's in this area. Of course, we know there have been topographical changes since the flood and all that, but still the Tigris and Euphrates River are still there. And you have these mentioned in the book of Genesis where the Garden of Eden was. So you have civilization beginning in the Near East. You have <coughs> religious history that is true religious history beginning in the Near East in Palestine with the call of Abraham and setting up of the nation of Israel. You've got the great battle of the ages is going to be in the Near East right here in Armageddon. This is Armageddon right here. And I've been over there and I've seen uh, the valley is quite large enough to, uh, to hold the vast armies of the world that will come against Israel in Armageddon, and you have the consummation of the ages right here in the Near East, because it says Jesus is going to put his feet right here on, you can't see it, but the Mount of Olives, right there, that's Zechariah 14. So while everyone else is watching what's going on all over the world, I keep my eyes on Israel, because Israel is God's calendar, and Scripture says so. You see, God is not going to... Uh, allow America to stop communism on behalf of the free nations of the world. God is going to stop communism on behalf of Israel. <laughs> uh, you got to get your eyes on Israel. And uh, for, for those who've never heard me say it, go home and read Romans 11 if you need to get the proper perspective of where the church stands in relation to Israel. It's quite humbling, but nevertheless we need to read it. And then we don't stumble over the fact that God's eye is on Israel. She is the apple of his eye. She will always be his wife. We're his bride. Praise God. And uh, he deals with her in a, with an entirely different program than he deals with the church. She's set aside for now. She has been since uh, the head of gold, Babylon. And Daniel said this is what will be in the latter days, these visions that we've taught you. And so uh, we're getting ready to see history consummated. But it's the Middle East. It's the Middle East where God <coughs> set Israel. It's the Middle East where he restored Israel according to Isaiah 11. Uh, we see according to prophecy that uh, Egypt plays a major part in end time events. The most powerful nation in the world of her day is now a fourth rate power. And God prophesied it right in Isaiah 19 that she'd be under Israel's domination. I mean, it's all through Scripture. Little Israel, scattered all over the world, and God said one day Egypt uh, will be uh, uh, under the domination of Israel. And she is today. Israel, uh, Egypt can't even move unless Israel uh, takes a breath. Well, they do a lot of talking, but you, you, you get your attention if you take Time magazine, if you can stomach the liberalism, get over to where they talk about Israel. <laughs> Uh, it's, it's a pink magazine and uh, uh, liberal, just like life and time. Uh, but um, nevertheless, they do report fairly accurately what's happening in Israel. So get over and read that. Because that's, and you'll find out that Israel's making all the moves today. A miracle took place in your generation, it was prophesied in history. And Russia, according to prophecy, has got her eyes not on the Far East, but the Middle East. And that's precisely what the scriptures say. And so she's spending a lot of effort keeping our eyes over on the Far East while she's building up strength in the Middle East to attack Israel. And she'll do it. You just mark it down somewhere. It's not because I said it first. I, uh, it's been said. It was said by Ezekiel first, but many have said it. But you at least heard me say it. Mark it down somewhere. When you see it. Is Russia go against Israel, you'll know that this was not a uh, fairy tale that we're telling you. So this is one of the reasons to know the Bible in this end time. Because it will get your eyes focused on the right places in the world at the right time. Because most people, I know I'm being repetitious, are looking in the wrong places. And therefore, as a Christian, you're praying about the wrong things. You've got to get your prayers in harmony with what God's doing, not in harmony with what man's doing. 
and Christians are spending a lot of time praying for God to stop communism in Vietnam. He isn't going to stop the Russians in Vietnam. He's going to stop them on the mountains of Israel. So if you know the word and know prophecy, you know how to pray. He didn't say pray for Cambodia and Vietnam. I mean as far as ending world events over there. He said pray for Israel. He said, I'll bless the one that prays for the peace of Jerusalem. Psalm 122, verse 6. So I pray, not as often as I should, but as I remember it, I pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Praise God. He says, I'll bless those that man will prosper that prays for thy peace, O Zion. So many Christians are spending a lot of time fighting communism when they ought to be fighting sin and the devil. Now you listen to what I'm saying because every time I say it, there's some that don't hear what you say. It would be very easy for me to just go through the ceiling when I see some of the things that America allows the communists to do right in this nation and all of that. But I know I belong to another kingdom, so I resist that temptation to get all upset about world events. <laughs> I mean, I'm so anti-communist, there's nobody here who knows how anti-communist I am. I mean, it's that strong. And so that ought to help some of you to know if I can say that God hasn't called you to fight communism, but to fight sin and the devil. Then somebody's telling you that who's more probably more anti-communist than all of you put together. As far, it's an, it's an atheistic, godless system. But he didn't call you to fight communism. He called you to fight sin. God, let's get with it, is using the Russians. And you're not going to stop it with your fighting it with your tracks and supporting radio programs and newspapers uh, like some are doing. Uh, even have newspapers trying to stop it. Christians, I mean. Uh, and I agree with what they write in their papers. But that isn't the way. God is using Russia and communism just as he used Babylon, just as he used Rome, just as he used Greece, just as he used Assyria to punish the nations for their sins. And for you to try to stop communism with your feeble Christian efforts, is, is, it is going against the will of God. Now that's hard medicine to take in a country where you've been taught to be a red-blooded American and fight for your rights and to stem the tide of communism over there so it won't come here and all of that. God is using Russia, and when he's done with her, he will destroy her just as he destroyed Babylon and Assyria and Rome. Now you listen, I'm telling you from the scripture, the prophets, the apostles, and Jesus never spent their time fighting anything but sin and the devil. That's what we're called to fight. You do not find them passing out tracts and getting on the radio fighting uh, Babylonianism and Romanism and all of those things and they were much more uh, severely being subjected to oppression than you are by communism because they had to live right under that rule and thousands of Christians were being persecuted and put to death and they never once resisted in fact remember the things we've taught you Peter and Paul both say pray for the king and that king they said pray for was old wicked Nero you see the, the apostles, the prophets, and Jesus knew God was in the control of history. You're not going to change history except with your prayers. Pray for these people, he says. Pray that God will save the leaders of the world. He says pray for the kings and all that are in authority. So you're called to pray. And you're called to demonstrate that you're not a part of this, this kingdom. Well, some, some are going to believe it and God's going to use them this end time. Not all of us are going to believe it. We've got rebellious, resisting spirits, and we just, we'd rather fight than switch. <laughs> <laughs> and when I make remarks like that, it isn't to be criticized anybody to try to wake some of you up that I know have spirits of resistance and rebellion. It, it's just, it's human nature, and you're living in a country and in a time when everything is, is fight for your rights, build a fence around it, defend it, and shoot anybody that trespasses. Well, now we've taught all in this area, so I don't want to repeat all of that. But the thing is, God is going to stop his enemies 
supernaturally. Man isn't going to do it. This world isn't going to be destroyed by an atom bomb. You better believe it. God is going to destroy it supernaturally. <coughs> he doesn't need atom bombs. Well, praise the Lord. Let's get back to Ezekiel 38 and 39. Now, if, if God can deliver you of that desire to always want to be fighting something, then he can get your eyes focused in the right places of history at the right time. He can get you to praying and interceding in those. Start interceding for Israel in the Near East and watch what happens. Uh, it'll, it'll change you and the Near East. All of God's program is going to be supernaturally fulfilled. Now, <clears throat> the destruction, we're saying the destruction of atheistic communism is going to be done by God supernaturally and as a part of his program, not for America, but for Israel. You see, 37, 38, and 39 go together. You see, chapter 37 is the resurrection, national resurrection of Israel. Clearly taught. If you've never read Ezekiel 37, go home and read it. It couldn't be any plainer. That he clearly, in two prophecies, predicts the national resurrection of Israel. And uh, the uh, church of our day teaches all oh, that happened when they came back from Babylon. Well, I want to show you today why that couldn't have been their resurrection and restoration from Scripture itself. That it didn't happen until 1948. The church of our day teaches that, that this resurrection of Ezekiel 37 took place when they came back in 536 B.C. from their Babylonian captivity. Now, all of you know enough biblical history to, that I don't have to give details on that. I mean, you know that for her sin, she went into captivity for 70 years, as was prophesied by Jeremiah. And then, um, after 70 years, Daniel begins to pray. We've taught you this just recently. And as a result of his prayer, he got the vision, the prophecy of the 70 weeks. And... Uh, then they came back after 70 years. Now I want to give you five reasons why that is not the fulfillment of Ezekiel 37, her resurrection, our restoration, because that has to be taken in connection with Ezekiel 38 and 39, which is the prophecy of Israel's invasion, of uh, uh, Russia's invasion of Israel and her overthrow. Now the first reason is Isaiah 11, I'm going to give a scripture for each of these. There are many scriptures. I'm just going to give you one for each of these. Isaiah 11, verse 11, shows <clears throat> that the return from Babylon was not a universal restoration. In other words, at that time, the Jews were only scattered to Babylon for all practical purposes. A few were in Syria and all. But the restoration God over and over predicts in scripture of Israel comes from the four corners of the world. So the first reason why that isn't the Babylonian restoration in 536 B.C. is not Ezekiel, the fulfillment of Ezekiel 37 is that it was not a universal restoration then. Uh, Isaiah 11.11 11 says, It shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand again the second time. You see, this is going to be a second restoration. That was the first one. He tells you it's going to be a second restoration <clears throat> to recover the remnant of his people which shall be left. Now look where they're coming from. From Assyria, from Egypt, from Pathros, from Cush, which is Africa, from Elam, that's over in here, from Shinar, that's Babylon, from Hamath, and from the islands of the sea. They were never scattered to the islands of the sea. They were never scattered into Egypt and all of these places when they were taken into captivity. They went to Babylon right here. So he prophesies here that even before the Babylonian captivity, Isaiah prophesies that there's coming a time when he'll gather his people from everywhere. Now the islands of the sea in the Old Testament always refer to Gentile nations, those that are off, you see, the islands of the sea. Well, they didn't know anything about the islands of the sea anyway. Remember, America hadn't been discovered until Columbus. But he's going to gather them from everywhere. They had to get over here. They had to get out in China. They had to get everywhere to gather them. But another reason why that restoration isn't the one of Ezekiel 37 is that uh, according to Amos 9, that when God restores his people, it'll be permanently. 
They'll never be uprooted again. And so that was not a permanent restoration from Babylon because in 70 AD, Jesus himself said you're going to be scattered to the four corners of the earth, and they were. Since 70 AD, during the, right after the ministry of Jesus, the Romans came in, destroyed the nation, the Jews were scattered to the four corners of the world, and they've been there ever since, till 1948. Ever since uh, 70 AD. Uh, here's Amos. 9 uh, verses 11 and following shows that the restoration, the final one, will be permanent. He says, In that day I will raise up the tabernacle of David that is fallen and close up the breaches thereof, and I will raise up the runs, and I will build it again as in the days of old, uh, that they may possess the remnant of Edom and of all the heathen which are called by my name, saith the Lord that doeth this. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that the plowman shall overtake the reaper, and the treader of grapes him that soweth seed, and the mountains shall drop sweet wine, and all the hills shall melt. And I will bring again, now here's where it starts, I will bring again the captivity of my people of Israel, and they shall build the waste cities and inhabit them, and they shall plant vine vineyards and drink the wine thereof, and they shall also make gardens and eat the fruit of them, Verse 15 says, I will plant them upon their land, Palestine, and they shall no more be pulled up out of their land which I have given them, saith the Lord. That has never been fulfilled. You don't even have to know anything about Bible history to know that. Because the Jews until 48 weren't even over there for 2,000 years. 19 centuries to be exact. Now this is just one of many prophecies. I'm just reading one uh, in each of these categories to show you the Babylonian restoration was not the one that we're seeing today, which is at the end of the age. And thirdly, it was not, this restoration from Babylon was not a restoration of the kingship. And the restoration that God promises over and over to Israel, she's going to restore her sovereignty, her kingship. She's going to have a king reigning over her again. She hasn't had a king for 2,500 years, even though now she's a sovereign state, she has a president. She doesn't have a king. The Bible doesn't say anything about a president. It speaks over and over of the restoration of the kingship. For example, right here in Ezekiel 37, and this is just one of many prophecies about the restoration of her monarchy, the kingship. Uh, Ezekiel 37, verse 20, And the sticks wherein whereon thou writest shall be in thine hand before their eyes, and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will take the children of Israel from among the nations, literally, not heathen, it's always the nations in Hebrew, I will take the children of Israel from among the nations, whither they be gone, and I will gather them on every side, and I will bring them into their own land, and I will make them one nation in the land upon the mountains of Israel, and one king shall be king to them all. And they shall be no more two nations, neither shall they be divided into two kingdoms any more at all. And <clears throat> so he, and, uh, he goes on to speak of David, verse 24. <coughs> and David, <coughs> my servant, shall be king over them. And they shall have one shepherd. They also shall walk in my judgments and observe my statutes and do them. Now David had been dead for hundreds of years when Ezekiel prophesied this. So actually, we know he isn't talking about David, but his greater son, Jesus. And Jesus has never reigned over Israel. Luke 1 says that he will. Zechariah 14 says he will. Many passages say that he will rule as king over Israel. The whole book of Zechariah says it over and over and over. When's he going to do it? He hasn't done it. Or maybe you're one of those that believe that God sits on the throne, doesn't have anything better to do, but he... He starts inspiring prophets to prophesy things that will never come to pass. <laughs> well, <clears throat> friends, uh, actually, we don't do justice to our own intellect and intelligence to, to say that God would write <clears throat> all of this, much, much of it yet to be fulfilled, just to hear himself talk. It's going to happen. It's already happened. I can't understand Christians who get the Holy Ghost and uh, I know you come out of those dead churches just like I did that said nothing's going to happen anymore. It's, if anything happens, it'll happen in the church. And then you start seeing prophecy being fulfilled, and we still say, well, it really doesn't mean anything because I haven't been taught that way. 
<laughs> and here's another reason why the rest, oh, let's take with that. Now, <clears throat> Ezekiel 37 said that they would have a king over them one day. Now look at Nehemiah 9.36. I want to show you that the restoration from Babylon was not the restoration that the prophets talked about. Nehemiah. You've got Ezra and Nehemiah together. If you can find Ezra, look right after Chronicles. Nehemiah 9.36. Now here Nehemiah is praying, and listen to his prayer. Nehemiah 9.36. Behold, now let me say before we read it, Nehemiah came back in the restoration from Babylon. He was the governor. They had no king restored. He was the governor. Came, he was in Babylon. He came over here, rebuilt Jerusalem. Now listen to his prayer. If you think that fulfills the prophecy they're going to have a king over them and be a sovereign nation in the world once more, listen to what he prays after they're restored. He said, Behold, we are still slaves, our servants this day. And for the land that thou gavest unto our fathers to eat the fruit thereof and the good thereof, behold, we are servants in it. Sure they were. They were still serving Babylon, our Persia, who uh, superseded Babylon. And then after them they served uh, Greek, the Greek Empire. And after them they served the Roman Empire. They never. So Nehemiah uh, himself tells us that that restoration is not the one the holy prophets predicted. When Israel would have her king, she would rule sovereignly over her enemies and uh, uh, be a world power once more. You say world power? She's a world power right now. The UN spends a whole lot of time trying to get Israel's attention and get, get her favor. You didn't know that? They spend a lot of time with little Israel. Trying to get her budge, she says we're not budging. Praise God. Well, she says that in her unbelief, but God had already said it in Scripture, whether she knows it or not, and God's just fulfilling His Word. He sends them back in unbelief, and then He saves them, Romans 11. He saves all Israel. He says, one day all Israel will be saved. You can't, you'll never convince, you'll never convince me, or I just say that for emphasis, but you'll never convince me you believe John 3.16 if you don't believe Romans 11 which says one day he will save all Israel. Praise the Lord. Same Bible. Now, <clears throat> look at Zechariah. I'm giving you reasons why the restoration that we're witnessing today was not, is the fulfillment of, is the fulfillment of uh, Ezekiel 37, but the res restoration of Babylon 500 years before Christ was not, and that is Zechariah 8. That's almost the last book of the Old Testament. Now you need to turn here and read these with us, folks. So we'll wait on you. Because you will... Saturday morning we're, ju we're just teaching. We're not trying to... do anything but let you see it for yourself. Uh, Zechariah 8, verses 7 and 8. Thus saith the Lord God of hosts, Behold, I will save my people from the east country and from the west country. Now right away, here, this is east. Babylon's east. She didn't, she's never been in captivity in the west. <coughs> We're west. You see, all oh, this is the west. We're the western powers, western nations. You talk about western Europe and east Germany and all that. You get it right about here and you go west. And so he says, I'm going to save them out of the east and out of the west. And, and I will bring them, and they shall dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. They didn't have that city until 1967 for 2,000 years. They will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God in truth and in righteousness. Well, you say, what's so amazing about those two verses that he's going to gather them from the east and the west? Zechariah was one of the captives who came back from the Babylonian captivity, and here he stands prophesying, that there's going to be a future restoration from all over the world. <laughs> you get the significance of it? He is one of the three, what we call, post-exilic prophets that prophesied after they had returned. He came back from Babylon. He was born over here. Zechariah the prophet. 
And he's got 14 chapters of end time prophecy. 99% of it's end time prophecy. And he stands after they're already returned and says there's going to be a great restoration from all over the east and the west. So he's looking way out to a future date. And then you get over in chapter 14 of his prophecy and look at the context of, of this when Jerusalem... This is in 70 A.D. when Jerusalem was destroyed, and I'll show you why. Here is Jerusalem under attack, very clearly depicted. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, and thy spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee, and I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall be taken, and the houses rifled, the women ravished, half of the city shall go into captivity, and the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. There are going to be half of them that are, that are remain in the city. Then, look at the context, then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle, and his feet shall stand in that day, that day when Jerusalem is under attack on the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem. This is the second advent. You don't need anybody to teach you that. When he returns, well, it can't be the, the, the armies coming against Jerusalem in 70 A.D. because Jesus didn't return then. This is Zechariah, who came back from Babylon talking. He was restored. And the church today teaches us that's the only restoration of Israel was then. And when Jesus came, they rejected him, so now they have no future hope or restoration that if anybody gets saved, it'll be through the church. Yes, one at a time, Jews, uh, Jews are getting saved through the church. But there's a time coming when Paul doesn't even mention the church in connection with Israel getting saved. He says the whole nation will be saved when the last Gentile is saved in the church. There's going to be a last one. It's pretty soon. I mean, like this generation, the last Gentile will get saved. And God will save all Israel. But here you are again, the context of... Jerusalem being under attack, she's been under attack many times, but Jesus has never returned. So this has to be the latter days when he returns. Now, <clears throat> someday if the Lord leads, we teach Zechariah. Uh, it's, it, it's all end time prophecy, but in case we don't, I won't say this while I've got a chance. <laughs> that this poor, dead, unbelieving church of our day that doesn't believe anything about prophecy, that uh, everything has been or will be fulfilled in the church, when they admit this, when they get to Zechariah 14, they say, we don't know what to do with it. You're Baptists, you're Presbyterians, you're Lutherans, you're Catholics, all of them. We don't believe this all symbolic of the church and what's going to happen to it. But when they get to chapter 14 of Zechariah, they admit they're whipped, they're stumped. Well, you go home and read it and you'll see why. Because these events are clearly depicted in connection with the return of Jesus. And these events fit into the other events in the book of Zechariah, which deals with end time prophecy, the restoration of Israel, her salvation, the destruction of her enemies, Russia and other nations, Egypt and all of those. Zechariah himself predicts that all Israel will be saved. Zechariah 12.10, he says, In that day God will pour out a spirit the spirit of supplication and grace upon them, and they'll look at him, upon him they pierced on the cross. And they began to mourn for him as mourning for an only son. Israel is going to receive her Messiah even yet. Praise him. Pray for him. He says, he'll bless you if you pray for Israel. Pray for her every time you think of it. Because there's where his attention is. He loves us, but remember he had her first. And he tells her in Scripture, you divorce me, but he says, I'm not divorcing you. He says, I'll punish you double for your iniquities because you are my choice, the apple of my eye. He says, therefore, you will suffer double, and she's certainly been doing that. But these are reasons. Let me give you one more. Joel, the little book of Joel that we're all uh, witnessing today since we've entered into this latter-day experience of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The little book of Joel says that when Israel is restored to her land, God will judge all the nations. And so he didn't judge all the nations when she was restored. In 536 B.C., on the contrary, the nations still ruled over Israel and have up until 48, 1948. Uh, the little prophet Joel here in uh, chapter... 
verses 1 and 2. Remember chapter 2, speak of the latter-day outpouring of the Holy Spirit, which we are experiencing. In the context of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, then we read in chapter 3, 1 and 2, but Joel did not write in chapters. He's got one prophecy. He just said it all together. So when you see the outpouring, he says then, in that day, in those days, the days of the outpouring of the Spirit, in that time, when I shall bring again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem, that is, when he restores their captivity, I will also gather all nations and bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat and will plead with them there. Not plead, the Hebrews contend with them there. I will contend with them there on behalf of my people whom they've scattered among the nations. <laughs> and so he says here that when Verse 1 says he's going to restore Israel. And when he does, he says, at that time, I'll gather all nations to judgment. Chapter 3 is the great judgment of the nations. Now, you don't need a commentary and interpreter to, to interpret that for you. He says, when Israel's restored, the nations will be judged. She was not, the nations were, had never been judged. Certainly, they weren't judged 600 years before Christ, or 5th, 6th century B.C. Well, I think, the scripture disposes of the argument that Israel has already been restored, and these are just a, one or two proof texts, and the Old Testament, as well as the New, is filled with proof texts that she is yet to be restored and saved. So, Ezekiel 37 was fulfilled in 1948 when she became, after 2,500 years, a sovereign state again to fulfill Ezekiel 37 in its political aspect, not its spiritual aspect. She isn't saved yet. But Ezekiel, when God said, prophesy to those dead bones which represent my people Israel scattered everywhere, he prophesied and he saw the bones coming together. He saw sinews come upon the bones. He saw muscles come over the sinews. He saw skin come over that, but the body just lay there. It was reorganized. She's over there. She's reorganized, but she has no life. Then he says, Ezekiel, prophesy once more that spirit will come into that body. And then he prophesied again. She came to life. It came to life, stood upon its feet, and it became a great arm. He turns to the Lord once more, Zechariah says. Uh, she doesn't get saved against her will. She'll, she'll want her Messiah. Don't, don't worry about that. Now, but let's speak of this miracle. Israel had to first become a nation, which uh, she did in 1948. But God started this move back to Palestine in 1900, roughly 1900, when you had the great outpouring of the Holy Spirit all over the world. And these people became Pentecostals. We call them Pentecostals today. They weren't then. They were Presbyterians and Baptists and Methodists who wanted more God, like you did. You're Pentecostal now. But with... In connection with that great outpouring, there arose <coughs> what is called the Zionist movement. See, the, the poetical name all through Scripture for Jerusalem is Zion. You know that. Zion. Zion. And there arose in 1900 a Zionist movement, which was a move throughout the world to get the Jews to go back to their land and be a people again, because four centuries had been persecuted. But as in Babylon, they didn't all want to return because they had homes and businesses and they were making all the money in their countries. And so there weren't too many that were inspired enough to go back, but they began to drift back over the years. But it wasn't the outpouring of the Spirit that brought them back. The starting of them back is what brought the outpouring of the Spirit of Joel too. you see. I mean, you have to watch Israel to know what happened to you. It isn't the other way around. And so they filtered back uh, until uh, World War One. Uh, Palestine had been in since 586 when the Jews lost their kingdom, went into captivity. Palestine has been under foreign domination. First Babylon, then Medo-Persia, then Greece, then Rome, then the Arabs, and then the Turks, and then the Christians, and then uh, the British took it over in World War I and ruled it by mandate. And so every month they had a quota. They had let Jews back into their land. But it was a small quota. And over these centuries of all this foreign dominations, the Arabs, you see, the Arab nations are all around her. And they began to filter in too. But they didn't uh, do anything with the land. They were 
there was no improvements on the land or anything of that nature. They just settled on it. A few, not too many. And the Jews filtering back, even though the Jew and the Arab are ancient enemies, yet they live fairly well uh, together fairly well uh, over the years since World War I or since that Zionist movement started because there were too few Jews coming in to be a threat to them. Now, the Arabs that were here uh, just would have little primitive villages, no lights, no sanitary facilities. They did not use agriculture to any extent, and it was literally a desert. Just like the Bible said, it'll become a desert. And you wouldn't know, if you go to Israel now, you wouldn't know what it was before, say, about uh, the 40s even. Uh, up from the 40s to now. It's all happened a miracle overnight. But during the great persecution in Germany by Hitler, and of course the Russians have always persecuted the Jews, and uh, so have Americans and everyone else, but especially the German persecution, five to six million annihilated, they began to escape out of all of these countries, especially Germany, and come back. But they had this British quota. They could only get a few in a month, so they didn't ask the British. They just used their Old Testament and said it was given to Abraham over in Genesis 13, and so they got in any way they could. They'd come in by night. Now, some of you are old enough to remember reading during World War II how that uh, another boatload of Jews landed on the beaches at night and they f uh, spread out and they couldn't find them, and so they settled. This happened all the time, and so thousands got back that way. I've seen the original landing boat that where they started with uh, one of the American um, landing barges. Uh, that uh, were in World War II, where it started this move back. A great host of Jews went back. Then the Arabs got a little excited. It wasn't their land. It was under British mandate. But, well, where does their enmity start? You get too many Jews and Arabs together, you've got trouble. Who? No, that's, uh, that's enmity too. Jacob and Esau is... Uh, the Edomites and uh, the Jews were uh, our ancient enemies too. Ishmael, yeah. Abraham's son. Yeah. See, Ishmael was Sarah and Abraham's attempt to help God get a son yeah. through whom the Jewish nation would come. And he said, no. He said, that's a son after the flesh. He says, I'll give you one supernaturally, Isaac. Yeah. And so there was always enmity, you remember, between Hagar and Ishmael, and, and Sarah put her out because when Abraham, uh, uh, when Hagar, through Abraham, gave birth to a son, then Hagar took advantage of the situation that, see, Sarah was barren all of her life. She had a child when she was 90, and laughed at it. Well, it was bad enough to have a son when you couldn't bear one by another woman, but it's, it's too much to stomach to laugh because you're barren and you've got the son. So Sarah made Abraham put... Ishmael and Hagar out in the desert. And here's where they went. And he became, according to prophecy, he became the father of many strong warlike nations, the Arabs. See, Ishmael is the father of all the Arabic peoples. And since they surround all of this land, then when the Jews began to come back in number, they said, it's ours too, Ishmael. You see, he's the son of Abraham. So they refused to listen to the prophecies of the Jews that it was given to Isaac. And you better know scripture there because if you go over there and Arab, uh, you tell him you have no business here, it belongs to Jews, he'll say, I'm a son of Abraham too. So you better know your Bible. But <clears throat> the British left in 48 and there had been so many Jews come back they'd established communities called Kibbutzim and had replanted trees and grass and agriculture, banana trees, orange trees built beautiful cities by 48. They had a tremendous thing going over there. And so they just moved right into that vacuum and declared themselves a sovereign state, the sovereign state of Israel. The miracle of 2,500 years coming to pass. Uh, now, that, uh, that uh, caused the Arabs to rise up against them. So they began to prepare for war, and there's been nothing but war ever since against the Jews over there. Uh, what you're reading about today is a result of their declaration that they were a sovereign state. 
Now, the Arabs did not do a thing to that land. It was just a barren desert. They really didn't have any possession to it, even uh, uh, in any sense, not scripturally or not even uh, by cultivating the land. The Jews went in there and have made a beautiful land out of it. If you go over there now, you, it would be hard to find a barren place. All you have to do is cross the Jordan. It's like a desert where, where the Arabs are. It's nothing but desert. And they live in primitive little hovels, no electricity, no toilets, no uh, bathtub, what's that? Uh, no sanitary facilities at all. And Jews have tremendous modern cities, cities going Tel Aviv and uh, Jerusalem and uh, many other places. And it's under agriculture. They have an economy going. It's a miracle. That's how one boy got converted under my testimony when I was over there. I didn't try to uh, reason with him about uh, Christians have the truth and all of that. I said, say, how about this miracle in your land? And I got his eyes on his land. And he says, oh, yes, said, uh, we did that by our own strength. I said, no, it was prophesied. <laughs> and I told him that this was God, the God of Israel. He loves the Jews. And he's restoring you and wants to save you. And so on. And that got his eyes open, and so he was saved, 17-year-old Jew. It's a miracle. I mean... It, it, you just have to see it to believe it. The contrast between Jordan or anything down in Egypt, it's, it's just uh, Egypt, one of the greatest powers in history. It's, uh, all you see is the poor, beggars by the thousands. You dare not give anything to one. If you do, they'll mob you, literally. Uh, a fourth-rate power, probably closer to sixth or eighth-rate power. And this little, tiny land is... Uh, is prospering like no nation in the world. And she's paying her debts, too. You say, how many people over there? Less than three million. Half the size of Chicago. That's a whole nation. Less than half the size of Chicago. Well, this is the miracle of 48, but the scriptures predicted that before Russia could come against a land, a nation, there had to be one there, of course, and so scriptures not only predict her restoration as a nation, but she really isn't a nation until she gets her city back. Now, you could be a nation in America and lose Washington, but she couldn't because all of biblical history is built around Zion. I mean, over and over, God says, I love Zion. That's where I will dwell. That's where I'll set my throne. That's this, this, uh, this city had to be restored also. And so then we've got the second miracle of the Six-Day War of 1967. Now let me tell you something about that. Over in, in the Middle East, we have countless millions of Arabs surrounding a little piece of land that you can walk it easily in one day. You can walk from here right over to the Mediterranean Sea. That's how big it is like 15 miles, I mean. And at the widest part, it's so very narrow. And it's only 150 miles long. All of the eyes of the world are going to be centered on this pretty soon. Already are in many sense, in, in a real sense, but of course they don't see the significance of what's happening. So <clears throat> what we have here is two and a half millions, roughly, people, two and a half million people against 60 million Arabs. I'm showing you it's a miracle. Two and a half million people cannot defeat 60 million in anybody's book. And so <clears throat> the land itself is only one half of one percent of the total area that the Arabs control. I mean, it's one half of one percent. The Arabs have 99 and a half percent and they won't even give them that half a percent even though God gave it to them in Scripture. If you ask an Arab, well, won't you allow them at least a half of one percent of your hundred percent? They won't even talk to you. They say the Jews have no right there. They were put out, it's ours. And they never developed it, never did anything. And let me add, because some people start sympathizing for the Arabs. Now, I'm not against the Arabs. I'm just telling the way it is in the Bible and what's happening. Uh, I'm all for the Arabs, it's like I'm all for the Jews. I'm all for everybody to get saved and have peace. But when the Jews moved in here, they did not put the Arabs out. That's the charge. And they're right there today. This Nazareth is mostly Arabic. They never did a thing about it. They never put an Arab out. But the Arabs in that war, 
in the 50s, and you see they've been fighting since 48, the Arabs took up arms, uh, the, the Arabs in Palestine took up arms with these Arabs, and so when the Jews defeated them, they had to get out. And so they said they were pushed out. No, they had they fled for their life. Although, although the Jew today will let the Arab back. Uh, he has no, he has, in fact, these cities where the Arabs, where they just had villages <coughs> without modern facilities, no electricity, the Jews themselves had made them, uh, lifted them on the uh, culture and social and economic level way up to what they were. So don't get it wrong about what the Jews doing over there. He isn't persecuting the Arabs. It's the other way around. <coughs> but you have the 60 millions and the f fighting that went on intermittently for many years between 48 and 67 when this miracle, second miracle took place. And uh, Russia, see all this time since 48, Russia has been pouring billions of dollars in here. Hundreds of planes, not only to Egypt but to Syria. Egypt, Syria, and Jordan are your three great Arab powers and there are many others but these are the three great ones poured billions of dollars, tanks, all the ultra-modern, sophisticated equipment, missiles, had all of that <coughs> building up <coughs> from 40, <coughs> excuse me, from 48 to 67. And by June of 1967, the Arab nations, if you can remember your reading your news reports, were ready to pounce on Israel to annihilate her. I mean, it was, a, it was, there was no question about it. It was not going to, uh, conquer them and let them live under their domination, it was utterly annihilating. And that's what they're still teaching them, that no Jew can live in, in their sight. And um, you had this billions of dollars of equipment and planes, and Israel had a little tiny army, I mean a little tiny army of a few thousand, a few planes, modern ones, but few, and uh, a even some of our equipment obsolete, like our tanks and mechanized equipment. But in the beginning of June of 1967, God, when they were prepared to pounce on Israel, God supernaturally intervened. And one morning, the Egyptians woke up, and the Isra Israeli planes swarmed over Egypt and destroyed every plane on the ground throughout Egypt. Destroyed them in Jordan. And the only reason they didn't get all the, the Syrian planes... <laughs> These are modern planes, three, four, five million dollars a piece. They just destroyed 290 in Egypt alone. <laughs> All of them. <laughs> they couldn't even land. They destroyed their airfields. Any plane that was up couldn't land in Egypt. And, uh, I mean, uh, in their military. And uh, Jordan, under attack, called for the Syrian planes to come and help them. And they said, well, they're so far out and so involved in maneuvers, it take days to get them ready to, to, to war. And so this is a miracle, you see destroyed every plane on the ground, destroyed all of the airfields. And then on the ground, in the Six-Day War, with their tanks and equipment, uh, when, when their tanks uh, started pushing down in here in the Sinai Peninsula toward Egypt, nothing could stop them. They, they just went all the way to Egypt without stopping. That in itself is a miracle. It may not mean anything to you, but it's a miracle to military strategists. They're still shaking their heads over the miracle of Israel's six-day war, that she didn't have any supply lines. You cannot stretch way out for hundreds of miles without, you just go so far and build up uh, strength and then you move on. She went all the way, pushed them back into Egypt without stopping. <laughs> and when their planes went over in these battles, they couldn't believe it themselves, but their planes seldom ever missed the target. Now you, you miss more than you hit with a plane, even today. But their, their missiles and their bombs seldom ever missed. Seldom missed. That was a miracle. They couldn't get over it. And in one battle in particular, up around Jerusalem, <clears throat> with the Jordanian soldiers who are noted for their fierceness and stubbornness, and the Jordanian will die just for the privilege of dying and going to be with Allah, uh, that every shot of an Israeli infantry in infantryman <laughs> dropped a Jordanian soldier. Every shot. And when the Jordanians saw that they weren't missing a single shot, they turned and fled. <laughs> and they captured millions of dollars worth of ultra-modern Russian, this all Russian equipment, destroyed millions of dollars. 
Egypt, the Arab nations have never recovered, and now Israel, of course, is in charge of the whole Near East. I mean, she dictates the terms, and she's the one bombing Egypt, and the Russians right now have sent 10,000 technicians into Egypt uh, developing missile sites. And uh, the Russians really lost face because they lost all of that billions of dollars worth of planes and equipment that she had supplied. <laughs> and what was the casualty list? 679 Israelis lost and 30,000 Arabs in six days against about 600. The Arabs, the Arabs lost almost as many in six days as the Americans have uh, sacrificed for nothing really over in Vietnam and all these years have been over there in six days and um, well it's a miracle it's a miracle it's a miracle Jerusalem on June 7th 1967 after 19 centuries came back to the Jews after 19 centuries and even in their unbelief they began to weep and cry when they got there once more so they could touch the wailing wall the wall of the temple there's still a part of the original temple there. That is the temple of Jesus' day. And I've been over there to see it. It's a tremendous thing, uh, the wall. And this is the first time a Jew could get near it for centuries. An Arab wouldn't let him or shoot him if he got near it. In fact, there's a no, it had been a no man's land, you see. And when we went, when we went, um, you can't go into any Arab country out from Israel. When we were over there, you have to go to your Arab countries and come into Israel that way. They'll never let you come out of Israel into their country. That's how much hate and enmity is there. And even in my filming, I just filming the old wall of Jerusalem, and you'd have Arabs walk up and put their hand over the lens. And you'd see why? You'd see machine gun emplacements up there. You hadn't noticed, you know. Uh, and it's, it's a tremendous miracle that uh, their city is restored, and their nation is restored. And that brings us to 30 and 39. But there were several supernatural, well, all of this is supernatural, but it's, you know, it's in the area of the natural. But there were several supernatural things took place. The hosts of the Lord uh, were there. And such accounts as uh, one in one case where they were driving uh, on this half track through Sinai and flames, a great flame, came up before the forces and they couldn't go any farther than the road and so they turned aside and a jeep didn't stop and went on through and they went right into a minefield. This was supernatural, a uh, uh, supernatural. The fire disappeared right away, you see. And um, oh, just uh, several supernatural things that have been related. It would be interesting to get all those catalogs. But where God was there fighting with the Israelites. You cannot surprise a whole Arab confederacy and destroy all of the planes in a few minutes. I mean, you can't even be that accurate in your bombing. They destroyed 290 ultra-modern Russian planes right on the fields of Egypt. Every plane they had. One of them, uh, the general in uh, charge of the Air Force later committed suicide because of it. Uh, he was in the air when it happened. He was getting ready. He was uh, making a reconnaissance of uh, this area here to get ready to annihilate Israel's forces here when the planes going uh, much higher than he was went over, bombed Egypt, and when he went back to land, there was no place to land. And they told him why, that we've just lost our air force. And the air force general there, no place to land. It's a miracle. Praise the Lord. Well, I'll tell you, friends, if you've never been introduced to what God is doing today, you ought to go home and start reading a little Old Testament with your New Testament. It's, there's much here yet to be fulfilled. The whole book of Isaiah, the whole book of Zechariah, the whole book of Daniel, the whole book of Ezekiel are awaiting fulfillment. When I say the whole book, I mean most of it. And most people think that's an old ancient thing for Israel. It's in the process of being fulfilled the whole books of some of these prophets. Like Zechariah, there's very little that's passed. It's so little, it's just a few verses. Praise God. Well, I don't know whether we've got time to get into all this other about Russia or not, do we?